Are there any veterans here? Me, 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 me. You're a veteran? <laughs> what are you a veteran okay, of? Also, we're going to start collecting. <laughs> what type, type of things, Miss Elaine? Items for the Dollar Tree. Yeah. Okay, we'll get, we'll get. Okay, class has begun. Amen. We're starting now. Yes. Okay, also, I, I wanted to share uh, something. We had a good time at Four Corners yesterday. Yay. Look at this great picture. Okay. Yay! Yay! All right, it was cold yesterday. Yes, it was. That was the last day of uh, Four Corners for this year, because we don't like polar bear evangelism. And this, this guy over here accepted the Lord yesterday. Yay! And so uh, he's already called because... Uh, He's looking for a place to stay. Yes. Yes. I'm glad he has that hat. It was, it was cold. And uh, I, I lost my hat, but it was in my trunk, and so it's found now. It once was lost. Now it's found. And now it's found. Hey, it's All like right. A, sounds like a Bible verse. So, well, look, Lisa comes, at least she says hello, and then leaves. Okay. Lisa, have a good day wherever you're going. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Bye. love you. Where's she going? Where are you going? I love you guys too. Okay. Where's she going? Like She's going to service. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, let me go get some uh, adult life. Just announcements real quickly. Um, uh, Christmas, Operation Christmas Child. We have, today is collection day. Bring it. Or bring it this week or whatever. And then um, Adult Sunday School Leadership Meeting is November 18th. But uh, we're going to be here with the sisters because we're going to have a uh, Thanksgiving. Luncheon. Luncheon. And, yes, next week. And, yes. Uh, it should, could be today, but I have mine in my trunk. I'm going to do it tomorrow, the next day. It was just convenient to bring it in on a Sunday. But if you want to bring it in during the week, that's fine. Okay. And so, um, all right, now, um, yes, we're going to be get, I'm going to be getting out an email this week to bring in items for our covered dish luncheon for next week, right? Yes, they're going to bring the covered dish luncheon next week. See, I already signed up. Good. Do anybody else need to sign up this week? But this will, and this will be a reminder also, we're going to be collecting <laughs> items Dollar, like dollar store items? Yeah, dollar street item for the ladies. We're looking for uh, gloves, gloves hats, hats, stockings, stockings. Yeah, and, and anything that you think too far Go to a dollar pay. store. I get my socks there. Anything it's great. Soap. Soap and all that stuff. And washcloths. Toilet trees. Okay, toilet trees. Okay, not toilets because only one. <laughs> uh, maybe not. Okay. All right, and then let's see, baptism services. Now, we're November 18th, it's the, uh, I know it's the third Sunday, it's a little weird, but we have one the first Sunday, not the second Sunday, but we're having it the third Sunday because today is, it was a weird time to have a first class because usually first class is the first Sunday of the week. Then we are now having um, baptisms after first class so every second Saturday of the month from now on it's going to be baptism every second Sunday it used to be every first Sunday but it's going to be second Sunday even though today's the third Sunday but okay just remember after this 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 uh, week it's the second Sunday of the month all right um, if your child has accepted Christ and desires to be baptized call the uh, Student, the children's ministry, and um, Mike Denning, uh, Dendinger is going to be here talk, you know, but his wife, uh, him and his wife, did, um, does a library, and they're, they're going to be doing the cost of discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and good, he's a great guy. Uh, missionary closet, they need things, okay, Lifeway curriculum, our new study in Genesis. 
Part two begins on Sunday, December 2nd. Yay! Sunday, December 2nd. Okay. So that's the time. The veterans' luncheon went well and all that stuff. Okay. What else do we need to know about? And Mike's not here. Oh, I guess I could do this. Does anybody know how to work an iPad and do a Bible a Gateway? Um, can I mention this, Paul? Huh? Can I mention this? Yes. Those of you who have already been back here, we have no food that came in, so come back and get. We want you to eat all of this food. We have some Subway sandwiches back here now. Oh my God. Wow. Wow. All righty. Well, I'm going to try and do this and this, you know. Okay, there you go. Well, we're going to begin the lesson. And let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for uh, your word and how it teaches us. And um, Lord, we, we do want to apply all of what we hear whenever your word is preached, apply it to our lives because it's so important. Your, all your word is important. Amen. Lord, thank you so much for the study we've been having um, in James. And um, Lord, just open up yourselves to us. What does your word say? What does your word mean? How we can apply it to our lives. We want to hear you in all of this. We thank you for what you're going to do. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 All righty. <clears throat> Now, in the book of James 3, I'm just going to be reading from 1 to 12. Hopefully we can get through all of that today. But um, it says this. Let, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth, so that they will, uh, now if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great, they're driven by strong winds and are still directed by a very small rudder. Wherever the inclination of the pilot desires, so also the tongue is a small part of the body. And yet it boasts of great things. So how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire? And the tongue is a fire. The very world of iniquity, the tongue, is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles, and creatures of the sea is tamed and driven by, um, it's been taken by the human race. But no one can take the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. And with it are, you know, we bless our Lord. And with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. And from the same mouth comes both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be this way. Does a fountain send it from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Nope. Can a fig tree, my brethren, uh, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce flesh, you know, fresh water. All right. Okay. Have you ever come uh, heard the phrase, I'm going to wash your mouth out with soap? Who's ever heard of that phrase? Had it done. Who's had it done? Raise your hand. Yeah. When I was little. Yeah. When I was little, somebody did it to me. Did you? Okay. And I, I guess now if you say bad words, 
we can say to our children, I'm going to change the Wi-Fi and tell you know, and not tell you the password. And today, in some homes, I'm not sure that anybody is drawing lines as to what acceptable speech is. I even get on Facebook and hear it, you know. And um, so, what is acceptable speech and what is not? And you know, at least in the same way um, they did when I was a child. I guess now. Bad words are okay. Yes. But it, it is politically correct, incorrect, to say something not socially acceptable. And I heard bad words all the time. I grew up with bad words. But you know something? This is the strangest thing. When I got saved, and I, this is back in 1983, I started speaking and some of the bad words still came out and I went, where did that come from? I don't know if you all had that experience, but when I became a believer, the first thing that happened is my speech got better. You know? And so, um, however, ever since I got married and had kids, and sometimes I hear words like when they're playing video games, and I, I tolerate it, but I have to take a water immersion bath you know, at the end of the day. That was a joke. And um, I understand that people have to express themselves, and I don't want to come off as holier than thou, but in my family, I really don't tolerate profanity, and you'll hear me say, what did I hear? <laughs> Through the closed doors. And then you'll hear, sorry, you know. Really? Well, we're studying uh, in the book of James, whose half-brother is who? Jesus. And I know he didn't hear profanity in his family. I just know it. I know that his mother Mary never used it. And certainly not Jesus. And using my sanctified imagination, I know that James grew up in a house that didn't use curse words, okay? Because James, yeah, it's his passage here uh, that's the most definitive in all the Bible in regard to pure speech. And if James were alive, um, and per perhaps he could speak today, you might say, to fight imagination, he would emphasize today, perhaps much today than ever, um, in the history of the world, the necessity for people to wash their mouth out spiritually. Yes? God's in the process of teaching me that it's not only just the curse words, but it's our attitude. It's and we have to be very careful what comes out of our mouth, be it, you know, it should be to edify others, and it should be positive. You're right. And we'll get into that, too. Um, and I'm sure that James was greatly exercised about uh, this matter of pure speech because he understood that his Lord, his half-brother, was exercised by it. And he understood in Matthew chapter 12, um, I think I'll go there. Why not turn to Matthew 12? <laughs> oh, where is he? He's in a prison today. Okay. Um, um, where Jesus said that we will be accountable to God for every idle word. Every idle word. And um, not just evil words, but idle words. Careless words. Words that serve no good and no positive purpose. And knowing the way the Lord treated evil speech gave him great impetus to treat it enough in the same manner, okay? And so, just as Jesus taught that speech was to be pure, James taught the speech was to be pure. And just as Jesus taught that the heart is revealed by the mouth, or I should, I should say in the mouth, uh, James, you know, let me just turn to Matthew 12, uh, starting in 34 to 37. 34 and 37? Yeah. And it says... Like this, starting, starting over here, 
but you get the picture. I'm probably not going to add this. You grew to vipers, right? You grew to vipers. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of what? Out of that which fills the heart. Get that again. For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure that which is good. And the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account in for it in the day of judgment. Where are they going to hear it? Does this deal with unbelievers? Yes. Does it deal with believers as well? Yes. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you'll be condemned. Now, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we might hear about that. You know? And so Jesus said that you are to be justified by your speech or you'll be condemned by your speech. In other words, your speech is such a revealer of your heart, you know, um, that based upon the way you talk, your eternal destiny is determined, Jesus was saying here. And the tongue provides the evidence of what your heart really is. This is very, very important. The new birth, regeneration, salvation, with its transformation and our sanctification, makes you a new creation. And it's part of a new creation, this new speech. That's why when you became a believer and you heard yourself cursing, you go, whoa, where did that come from? And we're going to find out from hell in the scriptures. Christians talk differently than most other people. Not perfect, but certainly different. And listen to what the Apostle Paul said in Colossians uh, chapter 3. Chapter 3, Colossians. Okay. Colossians 3. And it says, in verse starting in verse 1, Therefore... If you have been raised up with Christ, you know, where, you know, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. You know, it's sort of like everything that's happening in this world today, and more currently, politically, if you get on social media, there are even Christians using foul mouth words. And, um, but they do, and they're not even thinking about their speech. But Paul says, you've died, and your new life is hidden with God. You can look down at the mess from God's divine perspective, because we're seated at his right hand, and therefore, you have this new life, and you're to set your mind on things above where Christ is seated. And if you always think of yourself seated at the right hand of God, and a bad word comes out, guess who's seated next to you? You see? Therefore, it says, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Okay? For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked, didn't you? When you were living in them. So the implication now is now that you're a new creation. You have a whole new approach to life, a transformed nature, a transformed behavior. 
And this is very important because sometimes in this class I hear that Tom say, yes, I do. And um, then he says in, in verse 8, uh, but you also put them aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Put them all away. They have no place in the life of a believer. This is God talking through a prophet to us. And he says um, in, uh, in verse 9, do not lie to one another. That's another kind of illicit speech. Since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices, verse 10, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a new, a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created him. So that now that you're a believer, you have a new heart. And now that you have a new heart, you must have a new behavior. And that new behavior involves a new speech. A new speech. In fact, your speech is best uh, defined down in verse 16. Let's see if I can see this. Uh, in verse 16. And let the word of Christ dwell in you with all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in profanity? Bruh. With psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness, that sounds familiar, in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to him through God the Father. So your speech is dramatically affected by your new nature, by your transformation. And the new man in Christ has a new mouth, has a new tongue, has new speech. If In chosen people, if you hear somebody that is doesn't have a good speech, remind them, you're a new creation, politely. So the tongue then becomes a, a genuine form of a litmus test for the heart. And back in chapter 1, one I mean 3. Oh, no, it's chapter 1 of what we're going about in verse 26. Verse 26. If anyone <coughs> thinks himself to be religious, and yet does not, what? Bridle the tongue, but deceives his own heart. This man's religion is worthless. We want our religion to be pure and undefiled. How can you defile your religion? By your speech, by your tongue. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit the offerings, to do this, and to keep oneself unstayed by the world. And if the world says, you ought to say this word, you ought to say that word, we go, we don't have to say that. We don't have to say that. And unless your supposed salvation manifests its way in the way you speak, your salvation is nothing but self-deception. Mm. Mm. So we would say then, as James said in chapter 2, that faith produces works. What type of works? Good works. And what, what? It starts here, with the tongue. And one of the works that faith produces is speech that honors God. It starts there, and you all have the same testimony to prove it. Now, I, I want to talk about this for a moment so you can understand clearly some um, theological distinctions. I want you to get this. True believers, mark this, here's the word, true believers will have a sanctified tongue. Did you get that? Yes. Will have a sanctified tongue. True believers, true Christians, totally transformed people. Those who have been made new in Christ will have a sanctified tongue. And let me add something to it. 
true believers, get these two words, must have. We have, will have, but now we have, must have a sanctified tongue. Did you get that? True believers will have a sanctified tongue. True believers must have a sanctified tongue. And you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. If we will have, then why do we, you tell us that we must have this? Because um, this is like a, a sovereign reality in the new birth. And uh, the other is this human responsibility. You remember, God saves us. He does all the work in our salvation, but then in our process of sanctification, that's our our cooperation with him. It's us going, oh, you saved me, and then we take the first step, okay? And he's good to us and gracious to us, and like all of you have been saved, you've said, wow, this is Christian. And then he takes the training wheels off. And now, for the rest of your life, here on earth, you have a responsibility. It's not just, oh, God will do it through me. No, God has given us his word, and now we're going to, we have to do it. Right? Okay, so, um, so this, there's this reality that these things in our sanctification is ours to fulfill. And that's an amazing tension. There's a yeah. paradox, you know, of our Christian ex experience. If you're truly new in Christ, you will have pure speech. You'll have pure speech. And if you're truly new in Christ, we will take responsibility to make sure that we have pure speech. Because you know as well as I do, if you had kids and they're growing up and they're in their teenage years and whatnot, uh, they're going to say things that you're going to go, stop it, and then you might get into a fight and then it starts coming out of your mouth. And you can't fully understand it, but let me give it to you this way. We are saved by a sovereign grace, right? Mm -hmm. Chosen in him before the foundation of the world, yet we must believe. For God so loved the world that he gave. The world. His, does that mean everybody's saved? No, but those who take that next step of faith, become Christians. We have a responsibility. We're kept by the security of God, the, the sovereign decree, yet we must persevere. We live the sovereign, you know, uh, by his sovereign power, not I, but Christ living in me, and we must obey. And as James would put it, because we're new creatures, we will endure trials, and we must endure trials. We will receive the word to obey it, and we must receive the word and obey it. We will be gracious to the needy without partiality, and we must be gracious to the needy. You know, we will produce good works. We must produce good works. In other words, you'll never really be able to solve the fact that what God says uh, will be true of you. Must be true of you. Just because God said it doesn't mean that we can lie down flat on our backs and hope that it happens. And that's really the mystery here of the, this apparent paradox, you know, of the Christian experience, where there's genuine living faith and true regeneration and transformation, these things will result, and they must be a result. God will produce them in us, but he produces them in us through our commitment to him. You understand that? Oh, good. 
Okay, because I'm still learning that. No, actually, <laughs> you have to do this. Otherwise, you're going to be a baby Christian for the rest of your life. Otherwise, you're not going to grow. You're, you're just going to um, be one of those Christians that says, well, God, God said this will happen and it will probably happen. You, you know, um, God called me into the ministry, but you don't, you, know, you don't work for a living. You know, God, you know, all these things. Okay, so when James speaks of the tongue, he speaks of the truth that the tongue will reveal the heart condition and at the same time calls us to do everything we can to see to it that in fact it does. So, we can't just sit back and say, well, God says I'm a new creation. It'll all take place by itself. God says you're a new creation and it will take place, but not by itself, but through your spirit energized commitment. It's very basic. So while this, you know, this passage is a statement on the character of a uh, living faith as revealed by our speech, it's also a call for us to correct our speech because the two go hand in hand. Yes? All right. You're, you're talking about stopping your growth. And I first, I went, I don't know if you have this in your lesson, but first in three, when he said, I cannot feed you me, but feed you milk because you're right. you kernel minded. That's Hebrews, that's Hebrews chapter. No, I'm at first Corinthians. Okay, first, yeah, first Corinthians. He also said it. Yeah. And, and what he said, he could not give them meat. My question is this uh, according to their sinful nature, Paul said he could not give them meat. So can you give a kernel minded Christian meat and not just milk? Uh, yes and no, and this is what I mean by that. Yes, you could give them, um, you should be giving them, um, you know, milk, but also what to strive for. So yes, to both answers. they comprehend. Uh, whether they do or not, but they might say, oh, I heard that someplace before. You know? They can understand that. You're, okay. Uh, New, new believer in Christ, don't cuss. You sound like when Reagan's wife say to the drug dealers and the drug taker, just say no. Well, but you know what? I will say that to my kids. And when they grow up, they're going to remember this. You know? So, it also says in 1 Peter, and also in Leviticus 20 and 26, but first Peter, and I'll turn to that, first Peter 116. It says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. He's getting this from Leviticus, from the Torah. And you be ye holy, for I am holy. Be holy. I don't care if I even give that to a new believer. God wants you to be holy. What does that mean? You'll find out. You know? And these are... So, what, what God says will be true of us must be true of us. There's that paradox again. God takes care of the will be and we in submission to his power and uh, take care of the, you know, must be. Now, James sets out a compelling reason for controlling our tongue. Let me go back to James. Um, it's on the screen here. Okay. Number one. James, um, this is in, in three one. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as much will incur a stricter judgment. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that you will concur a stricter judgment. And here James says that the, the tongue has tremendous potential uh, to bring judgment, and he uses teachers as an illustration. And he says, let no one hurry into the teaching ministry, because the tongue has this big potential to condemn you. And uh, you don't want to get any, to any kind of situation 
where you're using your tongue unless you understand the potential danger that is. You know, I'm thinking about the name it and claim it crowd. Yeah. That if you just had enough faith, this is what's being preached, you'll be prosperous. And if you're not prosperous, well then you didn't have enough faith. And they go on and on. And the tongue goes on and on. Don't be in a hurry to be a teacher of the Holy Scripture because um, no one can avoid offending with the tongue, not even a teacher. Yes, Don. I know I talk a good bit, and I know what the Lord said about that. But people say, man, you'll be a good teacher. You've got the oration. And you... I said, God ain't called me to do that yet. You know, God ain't called me. When he called me, then it's time. Yes. And he'll let me know it's time. Yeah. Yeah, so. Then if you have kids, you're a teacher, yeah, you know. Yeah. So anyway, and you know, when you're a teacher, you offend with the tongue. The ramifications are far reaching because people are going to take it and go, you know what? My, my, my teacher said, my pastor said, you could lose your salvation. Or I just committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And it affects them their whole life. Mm -hmm. And they'll spread it, and they'll spread it, and they'll spread it. Notice he doesn't say, let no one be a teacher. No, those, those that are called, those that are gifted, those prepare, you know, whatever, uh, find time. But the rest, you don't, like, like God would say, you don't have to feel like I'm called to do this, you know. Uh, but anyway, um, there's a tremendous pressure on the teacher to teach the wrong thing, mm. to misrepresent God's truth, yes. and yes. therefore bring, you know, um, great judgment upon himself. Okay, yes? Yes. Um, and that's that's a hard thing to do. I'm, I'm learning, you know? And so um, I'll be the first one to tell you that. You know, so anyway. What did she say? Say it again. That's right. And James is saying um, to a lot of folks um, that are going to flood into the teaching ranks um, who really don't belong there, you're going to concur a strict judgment. Mm -hmm. Hold off. Learn. Learn. You, you know, don't bring that upon yourself. You know, um, because there will be chastening and whatnot, and very strongly. I may add, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that you will incur a stricter judgment. And it's my conviction that there are far too many people who are teaching God's word who are ill-advised, you know, to be doing so, and they're ill-equipped, and they're ill-prepared, and, you know, all that. And so, um, anyway, we need more excellent teachers. You know, and uh, James is calling for the same thing, a sense of the seriousness of, you know, correct teaching because the potential of the tongue, um, it's serious, it's a grave error, so the tongue must be controlled because of its potential to, to condemn. Okay. Secondly, the tongue must be controlled because of its power to control. What? Verse 2, you know, because if you don't control it, it will control everything. Verse 2. Um, for the, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle, you know, the whole body as well. And I'll, I'll get into it. Let me read verse 3, too. It says, now, if we put um, bits on the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct the in, entire body as well. It's a small little bit. Fits right in the mouth, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so they'll obey us and uh, that we could direct their whole body. And he says over here, look at the ships also. Look at those ships. Um, also, they, they, though they are so great, I remember the cruise ship, but you know what? The rudder is a little, little tiny. Yeah. And it's able to just 
the, you know, they're able to pilot that whole ship with just a little lighter. And then it says five, so also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts of great things. Okay, uh, I'll stop right there right now. But So James here says, look at the tongue. Look at its tremendous power to control. It's like a bit that presses against you know, the tongue. It controls the whole body. It's like a rudder that's guided by the helmsman. He turns this big great ship and the tongue is a small member. It boasts of great things. It has every reason to boast of great things because it can accomplish far-reaching effects, though it's small. And only an absolutely perfect, sinless person will never offend with the tongue. Do you know of any, by the way? Because I'll worship at their feet. And, um, and only Jesus was able to fulfill that. A mature believer, if he walks in Christ's likeness as much as humanly possible, will control the tongue. But we who are in the human flesh, you know, uh, we all sin with the tongue, and the tongue has this tremendous power to control us. And you know what? We're deceived by it, too. I could be, you know, when my kids were growing up, and I'm yelling at them, you know, I think that they're the scum of the earth. Look what you just did. Do I really believe that? No, the tongue was controlling me. Control your tongue. And that's the greatest sinning member in your whole body. And if you control the tongue, you control all the rest. Yes, Eddie. One thing that the King James Version doesn't give us uh, in the language is this word that uh, James uses about the tongue, uh, it's, it's the word for wheel, uh, and, it, and it's, it's, it's got the, the idea that, that, that as the wheel starts moving, our tongue starts, we, once we start speaking, That's it. this wheel goes around, around going. and it catches on fire, yes. and you can't put it out. A absolutely, we'll get to that too, yeah. And it's even more difficult nowadays because we think about what we publish, uh, the Twitter account, you're going to be talking People have lost their jobs. And people also, I mean, you're on there every single day. And there's so much more opportunity to make big, big mistakes. Yeah. And especially if you ever lubricate the tongue, you know, oh, yeah. you're out there going to really get in trouble. Oh, yeah. And publish, so we got to think about publishing as writing. Mm. That's your mind. That's what you think, you know. Writing is the same. It can also control. It. Oh, well. We can, get, we can get into that. We are going to get into it. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, so, when you apply the means of grace to the discipline and sanctification of the tongue, um, it'll cover all the areas because the tongue is the leader in sinning. The tongue is the leader in sinning. You sin it with it more frequently than you do in any part of your body. And people might say, well, what if, what if my problem is pornography? Is it with my eyes? Well, maybe for you, maybe. But you know what? When you get a lot of people talking, it's like a fire. And it keeps going and going and going. But what about my sin? I'm talking about your tongue will set a fire. We're going to get to that. All oh, the big fire that's going on, you know? You can sin with your tongue by simply saying something. By simply saying something. You, you can't do everything, but you can say anything. You know what I'm saying? And we all sin so easily with the tongue. We sin most readily with the tongue. We sin most potently with the tongue. So we must control the tongue because it's potential to condemn and it's power to control. And thirdly, Verses 5 and 6, we go back there, you got it, uh, 5, maybe it was 5 and 6. Thanks, Don, where you are. So also, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. So how great a force to set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The very world of iniquity. 
The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. We're going to break that down. The tongue is very dangerous. You know, verses 2 through 5, he's simply saying that the tongue controls. He didn't say it was bad. He didn't say it was good. And he just said the tongue is a controlling member. It dominates a person. And it's key behavior. It's, it's the key to their behavior. And because of the power to control, it must be controlled. Now he shows that our, you know, that our tongue, because of the power to control, is a very, very, very dangerous thing. And the power to control that the tongue has not, is not always good. In fact, it's very often bad. Bad. You know, and it's, it, this has this definite negative effect uh, or negative tone that dominates James' words, and he talks about the power of the tongue and its danger. So, um, we'll look at five again. You know, he said, even though the tongue is small, it boasts great things. Then he says, see how great a forest is set aflame by a small fire. Mm. Now, this is a, an explanation of the danger of the tongue. It has this fearful potency of destruction. He says, see, or, you know, behold, in some translations, how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the contrast, it really is staggering, a forest. And you can take one little burning cigarette, I'm thinking of where my son is living right now in California, you know, and set thousands, tens of thousands of acres ablaze. Fire is a fascinating thing. You could take one little tiny flame and set a whole city burning to the ground. And I have a, a cousin, her name is Cheryl Diamond Frank, you know, and I, I'm just getting to know her after all these years on my dad's side of the family. And she is, uh, she was uh, on Facebook and she said, we have to leave our house right now. You see here the progression. And this, the fire is on my street right now. I don't even know if my house is there. Oh, man. I, I, oh, I felt so bad for her. And you know, it's amazing. If you have a cup of water um, and pour it out, it doesn't become a flood, right? It, it can't. But if you have a match, you can light a forest or burn down a whole city because the way the fire is multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. And the tongue is not like water. It's like fire. It sets a whole forest ablaze in. Psalm um, um, 18, let me get to Psalm 18, I mean 83, 83, 13, the Psalms, um, 83, um, Ooh, I have Psalms. Okay, 83. Yeah, 13. It says, I'll start over here. You know, oh my God. Make them like the whirling dust, like chaff before the wind, like fire that burns the forest, and like a flame that sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. You know, I was thinking about that. I grew up in Chicago. And in Chicago on October 8th, 1871, it was 8.30 p.m., I remember it well. And a spark started in Miss O'Leary's barn. You ever hear of Miss O'Leary's barn? Oh, this is huge. And that's, it's just history. And it, it burned 17,500 buildings. 300 people were burnt to death, 125,000 people were homeless, and in 1871, they estimated the damage at, this is in 1871, $400 million by one spark. And, um, and I was reading that in a pan of rice boiled over a charcoal-fired uh, stove in a small home in Korea, there was, um, before that, there was a little a charcoal fire and it had done this great damage. 3,000 buildings, 
were totaled, you know, totally burnt to the ground, you know, in one square mile, you know, area. And now, uh, that illustrates the power of the fire. A fire. You understand it? Now it says in um, James chapter 5, I'll get it on here, uh, James, excuse me, 3, 5, yeah, Behold, wow, in other words, wow, behold, exclamation, how great a fire a little flame can kindle. And then in verse 6, it says, um, um, that in the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among the members as that which defiles the entire body and sets the fire on the course of our lives and is set on fire by hell. By hell. Julie. Okay. Uh, see if there's any correlation to this. But my mind just went there. Ephesians 2.2. 2. Yes. It, it says um, Satan has power over the airwaves. Yes. So... And guess what's happening over the area? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. And also, faith comes by hearing yes. the word. So that just emphasizes how powerful words are. That it is. Because Satan can control it or faith. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. And so, you know, wow, you know, how great a fire a little flame can kindle. And then in verse 6, he makes this point. And the tongue is uh, what a fire, and the tongue is a fire. Let me let me just go to um, Proverbs fifteen fifty eight. Proverbs fifteen fifty eight. Uh, I, I, wait, twenty eight. There's no fifty eight. Twenty eight. Okay, and it says. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. That's what it does. And um, uh, 29, it says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. Great. Okay, and it sees the mouth of the wicked as a fire. Proverbs 16. Um, okay, Proverbs 16. Um, oh, Proverbs 16. Hold on. 16.27. It says, A worthless man digs up evil, while his words are like the scorching fire. Like the scorching fire. Everything his fiery mouth touches sets on fire. There's a senator I hear on TV, and every time he talks to me, it's like poison fire coming out of his mouth. But I won't mention Chuck Schumer. But anyway. <laughs> but it is. I mean, you can see it even if you were, you know, on another side. You go, everything is like, he gets up. And, uh, and it's just like, just notice it the next time. I can put up a YouTube and you'll just go, fire, fire. I'm not into getting in political right now, but it's just fire. And it says in Proverbs 26, 20, uh, it says, like one who takes off a garment, uh, wait, wait, 26, yeah, wait, yeah. but lack of wood, no, um, I, I got the wrong one. But anyway, 26, well, that would help. Proverbs 26, 20 says, for lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no use intentions quiet down. You want to know how to stop an argument? Keep silent. Yeah. Keep Shut up. You know? And the picture here is that of the talebearer, the one who passes on an evil report of the slanderer, or the gossip, or the lie. It's like the wood that fuels the fire. In the St. Proverbs passage, verse uh, 21, like charcoal, this is uh, Proverbs 21, 21. Like charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so the contentious man, uh, so is the contentious man, is to kindle strife. The word kindle means to burn up. 
And the picture, again, of gossip and slander and the contention of uh, being a fire that devastates. And Psalm 52, 2 says, your tongue devises destruction like a red, sharp razor, a worker of deceit. It just oozes out, doesn't it? Yeah. And the tongue is like a razor blade, it says. Yes. No, in James the service says that, I mean, so James chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 and 9, it says, For every mankind, uh, every, sorry, for every kind of the beast and the birds I'm and getting the there. reptiles. Oh, I'm getting oh, I'm there. sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm so but Psalm 52, 2, your tongue, the, the tongue's a razor blade, it's a sharp razor blade. Yeah. And it says in Psalms 52, 2 and 5, it says, you love evil more than good. Your falsehood more than speaking what it's right. Say about meditate on that. That's what it means. You're, you love all words that devour a deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch you up and tear you away from your tent and uproot you from the land of the living. Say about Meditate on that. What are they saying on Facebook? Think about that or what, something like that. Yes? I can put on a red sweater, a green sweater, and if it doesn't fit my pants and my shoes, I can take it off and put it on something else. Yeah. Once a word leaves out of your mouth, it will never take you back. That's right. Never. Never. Ever take it back. Somebody and once I can said. I see you 10 years down the road later, yeah. and that same word will come up that you spoke. And it's still setting fire. It, it's, yeah. like, it's smoking it. It's it is powerful. Could, Somebody once said, along with that, yeah. if you say a good word to somebody, it very rarely gets to them, but if you say something bad, it lingers yeah. 400 years. Wow. Oh, man, that's, mm -hmm. yeah. that's why James 119, I believe. Yeah. Be slow to speak. That's it. Slow. Really, the whole thing is about that. Do something and shut up. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. You know? God will, yes. I was a lady who was whispering. Yes. Have you ever heard of this verse? So I can uh, speak when they is your mouth open or a tongue? Really? <laughs> Amen. I didn't hear that last time. And listen. this is very important for James, the brother of Jesus, to teach over and over again. It also makes me think of the Ten Commandments. Yeah, don't lie. Well, I'm thinking commit murder. Or commit murder or anything like that. Because if we speak, it starts there. You're right. And he says in Psalm 57, 4. Uh, let me just read that. Psalm 57. Oh, Psalm 57, 4. It says, um, My soul is among lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth. Fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue is a sharp sword. Job 19 2, he says, How long? He says to Bildad, he says, How long will you torment me and crush me with your words? These ten times you have insulted me, and you are not ashamed to wrong me. That's what's going on. The devastating power of the tongue to start a rumor, to spread a malignant lie, evil it's in its intent, it's a wildfire that cannot be stopped. Again, like God, once it goes out there, it keeps going. The gossip, the malicious gossip, keeps going and going and going. That's all it does. It just goes to, well, she said this and he said that. That's why James said again, be slow to speak. Right? You, you, you lie, and that lie goes from here to China, Germany, wherever it goes, and it'll come right back to you. Right. So you wonder, well, what's happening? Suppose it's not a lie. Absolutely, Bonnie. Suppose people speak because they want to put somebody down and they know something bad about a person and they speak that. Do you think God looks at that as a the same way as a lie? When you say say things maliciously about a person even though it's true. 
Do you think God holds that, that talk? Let's put it this way. There's going to be a judgment. There's going to be the payment judgment for the believer. Everything's going to be brought to light. Our motivations, our whatever, we may lose rewards. We won't lose our salvation. For the believer, they can lose their rewards. Yes. 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 Oh, yeah. Absolutely, yes. That's right. And build each other up. And build each other up. Because I, I hear bickering sometimes. We have the women from my sister's house here. And it goes on and right in front of them. You know, and if your speech is good, which, you know, especially when we're on the religion discussion group, and I said this before, there was this one atheist, and I was answering just politely, and you know what he takes back? He said, I think you're the real deal. Wow. So you, you never know what could happen. That didn't happen a lot. But still, you know, it did happen. Well, but Paul, can I say this in defense of the sisters? Oh, okay, wait. Um, what was ahead. the scripture that you used the last one? Um, it is um, Job, Job 19.2. It does. Yeah. Don't say anything. And you know, especially if you're married, and it teaches to us in counseling, if you're married, you're considered the dyad. And they could be bickering back and forth and saying all these bad things. They still love each other, but they're doing that. And then they might tell their parents, you know, this is what he just said to me. This is what he just said to me. Then the dyad, the husband and wife, get back together and love each other. But guess what? The parents still think ill of them. The other spouse. So don't air your laundry. You know. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was thinking about what you said about the sisters. The reason we pair them off with an LBA sister is to be a good influence. And with that, but then when you find some of the LBA sisters doing what the sisters are doing, and this is what bothered me. Then they learn to be relaxed enough to do that, to talk like they. But if you set their good example, they'll feel ashamed to come and talk like that. So mm -hmm. in a way, that's the reason we're paying them off. But I have known that the FDA sometimes mm -hmm. would do this in front of them, not thinking. And um, so what can we do? As a conflict resolution, you could go up politely to that person who just had this stuff come out of their mouth and say, our speech needs to be seasoned with salt. It's like a fighter. And if that person's not here, remind them. Okay. Or it'll be on YouTube or something like that. Okay. So, many times someone might say something like, you know, that it might be true about a pastor. And that could just totally destroy a ministry. And people could say anything. And uh, pray that God protects you from evil people's thoughtless tongue, you know, and um, who slander you and all that stuff. If the tongue is a fire, you know, it's a devastating thing, the tongue, and it must be kept under control. I think that's what James is saying. Anyway, uh, Proverbs 10, 5, uh, excuse me, 10, 19, 10, 19 says, when there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. You know, the tongue of the righteous is a choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worthwhile. You know, the heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of understanding. On and on and it goes. You have to get the picture. Don't fuel anybody's fire. Don't be the wood or the coal that keeps the fire going. And then you'll notice in verse 6, and we're in James 3, 6, it says, um, oh, wait, 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 wait. it says, and here I believe is the strongest statement that was ever made about the danger of the mouth. Okay? In fact, the statement is so strong, I'm not sure 
that I could convey everything to you that I wish to convey to you, but um, my, you know, in, uh, skills and language. Uh, but it's true that the Spirit of God will do it. This is the most powerful statement in the danger of the tongue ever. And it's verse 6. The tongue is a fire. It is the very world of iniquity, like Julie was pointing out to. The tongue is set among our members, that which defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of our lives, and then it's set on fire by hell. Mm. We got a world system going. Anything bad that comes out of your mouth originates from hell. That's what the word says. The tongue is a fire. It's a world system, a cosmos of iniquity. And this statement is so overwhelming, it has four parts. Follow carefully. Number one. It's a system of iniquity. That's a strange title for a tongue, of the cosmos. We often translate it the world, but it's world, not in the sense of the earth. And um, what he's saying is that the tongue is a world system of iniquity. It is the unrighteous, hostile, Rebellion order of our humanity, you know, our humanness. And its whole potential is evil. It falls short of God's standard. It's the focal point of our behavior, and, you know, uh, our being unrighteous, you know, within the man. It inflames all of our capacities, our effort to bring the whole world into this particular world system. And you see it on TV right now, just because it was an election. This is normal for the evil one from hell. He's going to wind up there. And he, but he, it's, it's normal for people to bicker and say all sorts of profane things about other people, not lifting a person up. It's vile, this tongue. It's wretched. It's a wretched, wicked system in our fleshly humanness. And no other bodily part has a far-reaching potential for this disaster as the tongue. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, why were we given one? Why were we given one? Well, I taste food with it, right? I swallow with it. And it's part of our sanctification to be tamed by God and not hell. And not that world system. That's why we're given it. Yes. Yes, and preach the gospel and all that. And we're getting to all this. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I'm getting to Adam too. We're getting there. You know? Paul, can I say something? Yes. To answer your question, God gave us a tongue to confess Christ and to bless him. Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. And we're going to get to that, too. Yes. But um, to follow up on what Buddy, you just said, yeah. one of the um, saints. In the we're supposed to praise God. We're to praise God, right? So oh, you're just going to choir. Okay. And so uh, you, you know. can talk and you can sing, it's, too. It's, so. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> Choose. Very good time last week. Very good time. Okay. You eat it or you don't eat it. All righty. Okay. So first of all, in and of itself, it's a this world system. It's a system of iniquity. You've heard of the world system, and it's a network that breeds evil. And secondly, notice how it begins to expand. The tongue is set among our members, and then it defiles the whole body. And it in it itself is a system of evil. Okay, we got it. It follows the whole body. And so you have a right. You have right in your body, behind your teeth, that's walled in your mouth, this system of iniquity, you know, that wants to run off. And you heard it many times. And what it does is it stains your whole person and makes smoke smell, the foul, the foul smoke of smell, you know, is just evil. Yeah. And James says, 
it's said among the members of our body, okay, and it's placed among our members, our bodily parts, that's to say it's included within all our human capacities, and the tongue stains it all, and he uses the word defile. It's a very vivid word. It just defiles you. So mark this down. A filthy tongue results in a filthy person. Amen. A filthy tongue stains the whole person. And what world of iniquity is set loose in our mouths, you know, that either burns, that smoke stains your whole person? And look what it says in Mark 7. Uh, Matthew, oh, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, uh, where is it, Matthew, Mark, mm -hmm. uh, verse, starting, uh, let me see, 7, 20, and it says, okay, uh, and he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, mm -hmm. proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adultery. You've heard yourself saying stuff like that. Uh, I, 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 I wonder how far I could go and not sin. I wonder how far I could go. I wonder how far the drugstore is so if I could get some of those books that have pornography in it or my internet. I think I'll just look once. Deeds of coveting and wickedness as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness, verse 23, all these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. And those sins involve the tongue. And even the other sins can have this relationship with the tongue. So a person is morally blackened by the blush, the brush of a tongue. And the word man here, it says the whole man. That's what it means. It simply means the whole person. And body is used in the same way that the soul is used. It just doesn't mean your physical body. It means the, the total person. And then the thought is expanding. First, it's a system of wickedness. It, secondly, it's the stain or uh, or burns of a person, the whole person. Thirdly, now it sets a blade, and the Greek is the wheel of birth, the cycle of life. What does that mean? The whole machinery of life. It not only stains you, but it touches everything you touch. It affects the whole machinery of your life. It goes beyond the body to touch every participant in this, in really your circle of life too, but not only your circle, but the whole circle of life. And people know you by the way they talk, don't they? Yeah. They do. The tongue reaches beyond your mouth uh, to stain your whole body. It reaches beyond your body to touch this whole network of people that are touched by you. The gossip, the repulsive speaking, the rumors, the slanders, the false accusations, the lies, the evil speech that can stain and pollute a whole family, a whole group of people, a school, a church, a community. And then it speaks of the fourth factor, the most devastating statement on the danger of the tongue. This is it, verse six, in verse James three, six. And it says, And the tongue is a fire, da, 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 and sets on fire the course of life, and is set on fire by hell. Gehenna. Hell. And actually, it's the word Gehenna is used here. And it's only other places it's used is in the Gospels. And not all the Gospels. You know, um, Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke. Okay. And, and the uh, Lord used it at least 10 times. And it's recorded, he uses the word Gehenna to refer to the burning where the damned souls will go. And you can read it in Matthew and Luke, the times that the Lord used it. It's a place where the fire never goes out, 
where the worm never dies. And he says that four times in one gospel. Where the thirst is never quenched. It's an eternally burning place. But what does Gehenna mean? It means hell. It's set on fire by Gehenna. And it was in the southwest. Uh, I don't know if you and I saw this. We didn't see it that time. But the first time I went, it, it, it's there. And um, if you stand on, the, on Mount Zion, you look south. And some of you have been there. You know, you, you see a deep valley that goes right down from the cliff. A low valley, the valley of Hinnom, Hinnom, right, Hinnom, the Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom, you know, the valley of Hinnom is Gehenna. And now, let me tell you about that place. Um, if we've read it in, in, first, in Second Kings and in whatnot, but when um, King Josiah, a good king, went in, they were, um, there was this, evil looking person, well it looked like a person, but it was really like a bull. And this is where they sacrificed human babies on the metal at hands, and they were just scorched to death. And this is, you know, and so, um, so from its earliest days, the place was a burning stench of uh, little flesh of children. And the Jews came to regard this place with deep disdain. They hated it. And yet, that was the garbage dump of the city, all right? It was the Valley of Gehenna. And now, in order to burn this garbage, and Jerusalem had plenty of it, in order to burn the dead bodies of the animals and the criminals, they burned the fire all the time. So there was a sickening smell of burnt bodies and trash and everything, and that was the... That was the town garbage dump. And you can still see that to this day. The fire never went out. And so Gehenna became a fitting symbol for this ever-burning fire, you know, uh, and the crawling worms to illustrate the future of the ungodly. Only in that hell, Jesus said, the fire never consumes. You don't just... And that's it. Like Daniel 12, too. Some will fall asleep in the dust of the ground and will awake. Some to everlasting life. Some to everlasting abhorrence. And this was it. The fire would never consume. And, then, um, and we could say that hell is the garbage dump of the universe, I guess. And, um, and also notice this. One, two, three, four. Uh, tongue. It's a system of evil on its own, but it affects the whole person by spewing out its filth. Two, it sets its filthy stain and fire on the whole machinery of life. Three, it's far reaching as the network of the influence of a person. Sorry. <laughs> and the thing that starts it all is for, it's set on fire by hell itself. Okay? In other words, behind it all is Satan. The devil, the flesh, and the world system. Okay. Okay. Tell her. Okay. So that tongue that you have in our mouths, behind our teeth, is a tool of Satan. And he plans to Okay, okay. And there's a tool of Satan to pollute your whole person, to corrupt the whole circle of life, and it comes right out of the pits of hell. And it leads right back to the... Yeah. Here, okay. Bury it! Okay, okay. Uh, that's a pretty strong description of hell. You know? Yes. Well, that's a figure of speech. I don't mean to be the devil's advocate and the people talk about it. What do you mean by that? In the sense that, you know, we, uh, what is the verse 6? You know, I talk about all these things. 
Yeah, because I've heard devil advocate in a good sense. I want to be the devil advocate. Let me test you about this, you know. But, so I, I, uh, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. A tool is Satan to pollute your whole life. Yes. Oh, going back to that, I know that they never really got that question answered. James is not saying the tongue is bad until it's in the bad influence of your spewing, spewing out things. But well, we're going to get to that about why God also made it. Okay. And so anyway, uh, no wonder James is so greatly concerned that we bring the tongue into control to honor God, okay, because of its tremendous potential. And I call this, uh, there's also a primitive, um, a primitiveness to, the, to combat. And what do I mean by a primitive thing? It's untamed, it's um, savage, it's uncivilized. It's undisciplined, it's, you know, um, irresponsible, and the tongue has, you know, will combat every effort to control it. Have you noticed that? It wants to control, not be controlled. And notice what it says in 7 and 8, for the every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed. And it's tamed by the human race. That's what it's saying over here. You know, and now what he's saying is the tongue is untamable. It's primitive in that sense. It's uncivilized. It's dangerous. You know, and an unregenerate tongues are more dangerous. And the tongue can't be tamed. And James says God gave man the power to control animals. You go back to Genesis, you know, and even after the fall, God. Uh, reiterated to Noah that he'd be able to get the animals into the ark. And when God says, you're going to bring them in two by two, and God gave him the, Noah the ability to do that two by two. And today, man still dominates and man is still able to tame animals. And if you go to the circus, you know, you've, you've seen a, a, a guy stick his head in the mouth of a lion. And you've seen, you know, people ride killer whales. And so for the most part, man is able to tame the animals. Ferocious, large beasts. You know, fierce beasts, deadly beasts, every kind of species, fusses, is the <laughs> Greek. Okay, and then he names two that walk and fly, and he names those that walk and fly, and those that swim and crawl, and those that walk and fly are beasts and birds, and those that crawl are, you know, are what, fish and, and snakes and stuff. And, um, but no one can take the tongue. No one's able to do that. It's dunamai. They don't have the power to do that. And James doesn't say, mark this. James doesn't say the tongue can't be tamed. He says man can't tame it. There's a difference. God can, by his power, and if the first recorded sin after the fall came from an untamed tongue. What do I mean by that? You know, where Adam blamed God, the, the woman that you gave me, to the creator, the one who could take the tongue, you know. So then the first act of the, the church was to tame the tongue. And guess what happened? You, you remember in Acts chapter 2, at Pentecost, there were cloven tongues of fire, and people started speaking in tongues and all that. God was in control of all that. God tames the tongue. And the first sin was the sin of the tongue. And in the birth of the church, the purified tongue spoke the wondrous works of God. But here, James says the seriousness of man's inability is, you know, to control his wild, savage tongue is because of its restless evil. Okay? And it's always it's ready to break forth. You know, it fights against resistance. It, it doesn't want to be held back. You know, and James 1.8 says it's um, evil. It's an evil poison, a deadly poison. It carries a death venom. In Romans 3.13 it says, their throat is an open grave 
with their tongues they keep deceiving the poison of asps is on their lips just watch just watch congress in motion and then in psalm 140 verse 3 it says they have sharpened their tongues like a serpent's adder poison is under their lips the tongue is like a snake it spews out deadly poison. The tongue is an assassin. And I'm just going to read this uh, real fast. Psalm 64, first 10 verses. I think I have time. It says, Hear my voice, O God, in my, in my, in my complaint. Preserve my life from dread of the enemy, hiding from the secret counsel of evildoers from the torment of those who do iniquity, who have sharpened their tongue like a sword. They aim their bitter speech as, an, as their arrow to shoot from concealment at the blameless. Suddenly, they shoot at him and do not fear. They hold fast to themselves an evil purpose. They talk of lying snares secretly. They say, who can see them? They devise injustices saying, we're ready with a well-conceived plot. For the inward thought and the heart of a man are deep, but God will shoot an arrow. They'll shoot him with an arrow. Suddenly they'll be wounded, so they'll, they will make him stumble. Their own tongue is against them, and all who see them will shake their head. Then all men will fear, and they will declare the work of God, and will consider what he has done. The righteous man will be glad in the Lord, and will take refuge in him, and the upright in heart will glory. And as you remember, the restless, wagging, poisonous lips of the Jewish leaders who accused the greatest prophet, John the Baptist, of having a demon and accused the spotless son of God as being a glutton, drunkard, a friend of the outcast, and demon-possessed sinner. And as a result, it was both John the Baptist and Christ who were murdered. And many people have died because of the deadly poison of their tongue. Even our own Lord, fiery tongue haters of the gospel, secretly induced men to lie about Stephen. You remember that in Acts chapter 6? And they killed them. They killed them. So the tongue must be controlled by its potential to condemn, right? The power to control, the power to corrupt, and its primitiveness to combat it fights against evil finally the tongue is hypocritical it can't be trusted yes Yeah, it's the same thing. It's a tongue thing. Oh yeah, yeah. And then you better say, you better be able to call a, a transgender. That would make you say something. It was a, I just read this yesterday with a professor who was going to be fired for not calling a transgender woman a man. And so, you know, this is part of the world system that we're talking about. And the tongue is hypocritical. Yep. It can't be trusted. You know, um, it says, you know, one thing at one time, but mean another. In the, uh, and it says in verse 9, let me go back to James 3, 9. Uh, where is it? With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. That means everybody, believer or unbeliever, from the same mouth come both blessing and cursing, my brethren, and these things ought not be this way. Now, isn't that wonderful? Your tongue, my tongue, can be used to bless God, even the Father. That's one reason we've got a tongue. Let every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, and um, this is very relevant, by the way, to the Jews 
to whom James writes, because whenever they mention the name of God, they en they ended with you know um, you know Shemoe Yisrael. And the most wonderful function of the tongue is to bless God. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men, and we've been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be that way. There's a duplicity in all this. There's hypocrisy in all this. The same tongue that blesses God curses those made in his image. And they slander them. They criticize them. They abuse them. And the same mouth of the Pharisees that is one breath, bless God, cursed Christ. And then I always think of the mouth of Peter who says, Oh, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And later, out of that same mouth, you know, what does he say? He denied I never knew him. And from the same mouth, your mouth, the mouth of all of us, comes blessing and cursing. Verse 10. From the same mouth comes blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Right? It isn't right. Any profane speech is inconsistent. It's unacceptable. It's a compromise. God saved us. And when God saved us, he transformed us. And then when he transformed us, he gave us a capacity for new speech. He expects us to speak that way. Remember what I said earlier. God really created the tongue, and he expects us, and we must speak a certain way. It's part of our sanctification. You know, it's impossible to compromise, you know, Anyway, and, out, and James illustrates it with this word picture, verse 11 and 12. Does a fountain send out forth the same opening, both fresh and bitter water? What's a rhetorical answer to that? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives? Or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. So does a fountain send out fresh water and bitter water? No. That's a simple illustration. You can't have that. And then verse 12, can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? No. No. Okay. No. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Uh, I'll get that in a second. No. I'm teaching, I'll call you back. <laughs> okay. No. It, no, you can't do that. Okay. And um, how about this? A vine with figs. It's impossible. Let nature tell you what's obvious. You can't have bitter and sweet coming out from the same fountain, yada, yada, yada. Okay? And he's saying uh, a clean heart, a fresh heart, can't produce bitter water. You know, a bitter heart can't produce fresh water. You know, and it's possible to have a bitter heart. Just control your tongue. Let it go away. You know? So he's right back to where he started. True believers will be revealed in their speech, right? And if you're a true believer, it should be able to be seen by your speech. You say, well, wait a minute. Once in a while, there's a lot of bitter coming out of this fresh new creation. You know, I know that. But James is drawing exact lines, and he's saying it's, um, it's a truism, that salt water can't come out from a fresh fountain. And it's a truism in your life that if you've been transformed by Christ, your speech will show it. That's what he's saying. And a grapevine must have its source, a olive must have its olive source, and salt water must have its... Salt water source, you know, bitter words come from a bitter heart. Critical words come from a critical heart. Defamatory unloving speech comes from a heart where the love of Jesus is a stranger. Okay? And true believers will be revealed in their speech and they must be revealed. So, 
as we taught at the beginning, I taught at the beginning. True believers will be revealed by their speech, and believers must be revealed by their speech. You say you're a Christian, and that God gave you a tongue? <coughs> Control it. Bless people with it. That's why he gave it to us. That's why he created it. To be new creatures in Christ. So, James comes to this big tension in view. If you're a Christian, this is how it will be. If you're a Christian, this is how it must be. Okay? And so I'll say it's true. He calls us to be sure that it's true. In Luke 6, let me, this is probably one of the last um, scripture verses, but it says in Luke chapter 6, verse 43, 45, I guess, uh, 43, it says, for there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. Where do you think James is getting this from? From his half-brother. And the good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what's good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. For the mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. And I believe Jesus, James had this passage in mind when he wrote this. He knew exactly what his brother was saying. If anybody says, oh, I think this is Buckus. No, he's repeating what Jesus said. And a true believer is known by his speech. A true believer speaks, you know, with a tongue that's in control. And Peter says a true believer will love life. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 10. And it says, For the one who desires love, to love and to see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking evil. Deceit. Amen? Okay. And he goes on, he must turn away from the evil, do good, and he must seek peace and pursue it. On the one hand, we will, and on the other hand, we must. And so, James warns us about two things. That we're revealed by our mouth, and that our mouth has tremendous potential for disaster. Okay? Okay? And he calls for us to have a tame tongue. And if we do, it's evidence that we're a Christian. Okay? So, um, as you look at your life, if you see these things that, come, that are coming out of your mouth, you know, that ought not to come out, you need to confess it as sin and turn from it. And how to react to those times when, you know, um, the bitter water comes out from the sweet fountain is a key to your spiritual strength. He's working us. Okay? And um, let's pray. One question. Well, yes. Forgot, Before I pray, let's ask questions. Yes. <laughs> okay. Did he ask your question? Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Julie. A real life application. Yes. Okay. If, if something bad happens, to somebody who's really evil, and I say, oh, I'm glad that happened to him. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of that. Okay, so. Oh, you're the only one. Uh, There's nothing new under the sun. Okay, okay. But, but what I'm saying is that, is, is that, that that's not. You know, what to, you know, if you notice on my Facebook, I'll, if somebody says something really rotten, you're, well, God bless them. So I'm, not, so I'm not, so if I say, I'm glad Hitler died. If I say something like that, what I'm saying to you, I mean, I do these things. No, we all do. But if that's wrong? Which produces filth in this world, you know. But no, you said your thing, as long as you, I, you know what? I don't like Hitler anymore. Okay. okay. What Jesus said, you full of dead man bones. Yes. He spoke the truth. Yes. What he spoke in the hear that? He's full of, Jesus was full of dead man's bones. Yeah, Jesus yeah. spoke, you, he said you vipers, you full of dead man's bones. He spoke the truth, but he spoke it in love 
to the yeah. He, he yes. wanted them to repent. He even told Peter, get behind me, Satan. He called Peter Satan yes. at that time. Yes. But we are made in God's image. Yeah. And in the image of God. And he, you have to speak, he say, cry out loud. You know, raise your voice up like a trumpet. Even Jonah didn't want to go back and tell the people. Right. But there's time for all things. You got to know. You know, Holy, you, it says Holy in Spirit. Proverbs 26, it says, you know, answer a fool according to his folly sometimes. Right. We're talking about that. And sometimes you have to. But don't use it a lot. You know? That's good. Anybody else? The more, yes. The most part I think that God's shown me is that what comes out of our mouth should edify. Yes, it is. And teach, though. You know, but it's also, and love. You know, it's that's also that. should rebuke. That's Woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites! Okay. Yes. Uh, the bottom line says we can't control the tongue, but we, if we're walking in the Spirit, then we ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Hey, that, yes! That's what I'm saying. You got it! Yes, he controls it. We can't. Okay. It's like the pastor of the city. The rule of the church. When James, I think, in all thumbnails we could do, this is what honors the Lord. This is what honors the Lord. You know? And he had a good uh, teacher. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Well, um, you know, we are on this path of sanctification, and I pray of the Psalm uh, 139, 23, that says, Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there's Absolutely. any way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Amen. Amen. Romans 12. Amen. Amen. That is great. So, yes, Ophelia. A little commentary. We should pray for our own self. No. Yes. Keep the door of our lips. Because we can open any time, and it's for good or it's for bad. Yes. So, and that word that you say, you have to remember. Whatever you say bad about somebody, about whatsoever, or the way you use it, you're going to give account. Amen. If you are a child of God, you're going to give account. We're going to give an account. We're going to stand before the judge and give an account. Yeah. Yeah. Everything is with me. Don't remember. Everything Lips. is in the book. Lips sink ships. Amen. Yes. <laughs> I like that. Okay, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray. What does your word say? What does it mean? How can we apply it to our lives? Help us to control the tongue. Give us the power to do that. And may we be the good men who out of the good heart, the good treasure of our heart, bring forth good things, sweet fountains that bring forth sweet water. And may it be that every time we open our mouth, we minister grace to the hearers. And I'm reminded in Ephesians 4, 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Lord, you said in um, Luke 14, 34, let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt. And Lord, may we um, pe may people know us not only by what we do, but what we say. And may we be characterized by holy speech, so it would be known that we're your children. And we thank you for enabling us to do that, because you've given us a new heart, and with it a new tongue. And we bless your name, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good. Don't forget to bring your cup of dish next week.